Can I start? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Recently, I've been struggling with practicing in regards to wanting to do it or having to do it. My professors at school and my friends in the orchestra I'm part of tell me it's about discipline. Uh, I understand that in order to become better, I need to keep practicing. I tell myself that I will do, and I end up wasting the day away without doing so. I was wondering what you do or have done in order to make it seamless, consistent part of your daily routine. That was pretty long. But I guess <laughs> the question is um, motivation. It seems like, um, what do you do to motivate yourself to practice? Well, I don't need yeah, to be mo motivated to practice, but I'm, I have had many, many students who don't know what to practice or even how to practice. Yes. So I recommend a book, which isn't just a single book, it's a course of practice. It's called The Systematic Approach to Daily Practice. It's by Claude Gordon. And mm -hmm. it, there are 52 lessons in the book, one for every week of the year. And it, it really covers every aspect of playing. If you did nothing else in the day, it would take you about an hour to do each lesson. If you did nothing else, you would hear a huge improvement in a matter of weeks. But you would have to be uh, quite disciplined with yourself. Today, I'm going to do it between this time and that time. Now, when I was very young, 100 million years ago, uh, <laughs> I used to love to practice first thing in the morning, so around 7, 8 in the morning. I still do this because then the rest of the day is my own. You get that done, then you can get on with it. But it's true, just remember this motto, every moment that you're not practicing, somebody else is. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I guess uh, same thing. Uh, for me, I'm not like very particular with the books, but for me it's having structure and what structure brings for me is I can calculate the goal and it's very, um, I can anticipate and um, uh, kind of expect the goals and uh, and the progression becomes uh, a little bit more obvious and, and that kind of gives me a lot of motivation. If I'm, if I go to my practice without plan and I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go by the feel, it usually ends up, and you know what, I've seen some people, I cannot say that, I've seen some really good players who just go and go by the feel and they just pull it off, just, it never worked for me. If I have uh, exact goals, and sometimes your face does not feel well or you're a little bit tired, but even on those occasions, you know, okay, I'm going to cut a little bit off from this exercise. So having like a, a good structure, an idea of what you're doing is, for me, it's something that uh, makes, makes the whole thing way more exciting. Also, you can always switch on the Netflix when you practice. Uh, I know many people who, who, who practice with the TV. I uh, warm up. I, I, I'm, I'm going to confess, I do some of the warm-up easy exercises with Netflix often. And, uh, it, it, but that's probably not the, the suggestion. But I think, I think without, without a structure, if you can't... It, I think if you can't imagine or make a structure for yourself, right. then something like the Claude Gordon systematic is already done for you. Yeah. Just do what it says. I'm going to teach you later on. You can write your own stuff. Exactly. So. Okay, let's roll the other one. I'm emailing you about my mouthpiece pressure. I know I use too much, uh, but I can't seem to overcome not using as much as I do. It has gotten to the point where I have scar tissue formed where my mouthpiece is placed but I have no clue what to do about it. My stamina playing playing high is good, but I'm not but not amazing. I attribute to sorry, I attribute that to the pressure that I end up using. I just need some advice on being able to convert from the way I play now to a better way of playing. Yes, pressure. So can can you explain why generally people feel the need to pressure their lips? Me yes. If people use too much pressure, it's because they're not directing the air efficiently yeah. and and or the buzz, particularly in the high register, is not working well enough for them. So one way to train yourself away from using too much pressure is, is I use a burp. I have one attached to two of my horns. It's a little attachable shank where you can just... It's a little plastic pieces. thing that goes on oh, the no. side. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's basically a buzzing tool. It helps you buzz. And what I do is I start off with a B flat and 
work the scales and I actually move the valves whilst I'm buzzing so it gives me that idea of uh, this valve combination feels like this when I want that note to be. Uh, now if you can free buzz or buzz up as high as you co can go then basically all you do is you put the mouthpiece on and that'll make the note. So uh, and put the mouthpiece on will make a high C or whatever note you need. The thing is that to get to there you need to practice a lot of free buzzing so that these muscles uh, become quite strong. It's too easy to say use less pressure yeah. but you need to have the tools to be able to do it first. So build up your free buzz, keep going up in stages, baby steps and then when you can buzz fairly high you'll find that you don't need that pressure and when you feel you don't need that pressure in the high register then you'll start to back off. Yeah and there's one thing that pressure like Hugh, Hugh does not over pressure too much even people who do not pressure much they pressure too much there's always like a, a way to improve that and especially with younger players where they always get this problem where I'm pressuring too much and what do I do so usually is there a quick solution I, I don't I don't think there's that many areas in brass playing where you, Fingers is something I, I think you can could be a quick solution. That's a pretty obvious one because you can visually see. You cannot see why there. Because for me, usually the tendency, the reason why people feel the need to put that that access pressure is because their lips aren't opening too wide. Mm. They're not shutting, so they can buzz. It means this is not. It's not shut. strong enough. So it's not shut. Mm. Yeah. So that's why you feel the need to compensate to shut it with your mouthpiece, and obviously it cuts off the blow, and then uh, cut, cuts off the. Uh, Cuts off the uh, blood flow, and uh, that's where you start getting, you know, the lack of buzz. But it, it does speed up the vibrations of the lips to a certain extent, so that's why pressing on on the lips actually works to a certain extent. That's why people do it. If it didn't work at all, yeah, people wouldn't do it. But it works to a certain extent, and and that's why people are tempted to, to do it. Now, there's. You know, I'm Mr. Gadget with these things. I have a gadget for this. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a mouthpiece shank with a spring inside. And basically, if you press uh, too much, the mouth, oh, the spring closes, spring closes yeah. and the air escapes on the side. Okay. Uh, I nickname it the instrument of torture. <laughs> but it's a very quick way to kill the problem. Or at least uh, identify it, I guess. No, it really does help. You know, mm -hmm. I've, if I... I have three students now, funnily enough, all three of them on trial for the London Symphony Orchestra, uh -huh. who had pressure problems that used this thing and they cured it within within weeks rather than years. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, you get used to uh, being able to play up higher okay. without that. And it's the, you, as soon as that closes a couple of times, you try and avoid it. You remind yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite useful. Uh, what they're called, I don't know, but I, I think uh, the last one I saw was at Warburton, the mouthpiece maker. He had one, which was very effective. Mine was made uh, by the, by Melton or Meinl in Gerrit Street, Germany, and they're very useful. Okay. So, do you want to roll another one? This one, sure. Uh, what kind of things did you do to facilitate the growth and range and being able to use it so freely? Uh, high range. <laughs> How do you get good at high range? <laughs> well, uh, basically what I do for high range is that since I was about 15, uh, I've been trying to add a note on top of my range every year. Dramatic, 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 uh, a whole step. If I could get a whole step on a year, that would be pretty good. Now, uh, again, uh, I, I go back to the trumpet literature and I already mentioned the Systematic Approach to Daily Practice by Claude Gordon. Now, the basis of that technique is to develop the false tone. So on a three-valve trumpet, you're playing F below the low G, the low F sharp with the first valve. You're playing E with the second valve, E flat with two and three. Now, the trumpet doesn't have a fourth valve. So when we take over those, um, those exercises, what it does is it helps you develop uh, the embouchure to enable you to start going high okay. and so you start to use that airstream in a way that's very um, efficient because you're putting the air really where it doesn't want to go in the low F 
pedal F on the trumpet shouldn't exist. So like a lip bend? It's a lip bend thing, but it's between that harmonic, the, the low F sharp and the pedal C. Okay. And that really develops the, the chops. And then I start doing long notes. C, G, C, E, G, B flat, C, D, keep going up, up, and these are long notes, eight beat notes, and I rest as much as I play. So you play the, the C for, uh, or any note for eight beats, you count eight beats rest because you don't want to kill yourself. As you go higher, adopt a three strike rule, try the note three times. If you fail, Fire. that's it for the day. Fire. That's it for the day. Do some relaxation, some long notes, some pedal notes, just to re relax the face. Next day, do the same exercise. Keep going up in stages, in stages, and uh, eventually you will develop it. But uh, do check it out. Um, there's a book called How to Play Double High C in 13 and a Half Weeks. Very useful. I did mine in 12, so I felt very proud of myself. <laughs> and uh, then the other one, Claude Gordon, the systematic approach to daily practice, that will help you really build up everything. Um, I know like various players, when he, when he, when it comes to high range players like Arturo Sandoval comes in, in mind, and I've seen his methods and he is, uh, he plays high range all the time. But for me personally, high range has been something that uh, I consider uh, one of the stronger points of my playing. And I, I feel like the less high range I practice, the better it gets. And for me, it's not necessarily, because I know I can always pull the trigger when, when it's necessary, but for me, it's, it's more about understanding where's the problem. So when it comes to pitch and getting high range, and usually people who have a bad high range, they usually don't have a very good low range either. You normally have a good no range because that's that comfortable airspeed and that's a comfortable range. So sometimes for, for me it's more about controlling and understanding the airspeed and making sure that you control the pitch with airspeed rather than you know stretching or you stretching your ambusher or doing all sorts of funky stuff with your face. For me it's all about making sure that the airspeed is changing quite a bit and that can be achieved for me. It, it doesn't matter. It can be lip flexibility. It can be bending, it can be chromatic scales, it can be, you know, you know where I'm heading. So yeah. I'm always a, a lot, I'm a, a bit more um, into figuring out what's the actual basic problem rather than specific exercises. But I guess it's apple and oranges, it works. Some people are a little bit more particular, they love specific mm. exercises. And, um, There's a, another old fashioned way of helping the high register is just to think of the vowel sounds that yeah, the yeah, vowel yeah. shapes that your mouth make as you go higher think E and you'll find that the back of your tongue raises and in that moment that speeds up the air yeah, that's exactly yeah, yeah. why what you're saying works the air speed needs to be quicker now there was an experiment made uh, with members of the Chicago Symphony some years ago where they took the uh, trumpet and the tuba and the trombone and they put uh, little electrodes inside the mouthpieces of the players okay. to find out what the airspeed was in each of those instruments mm -hmm. and, and what they found is that the airspeed was the same on a middle C on all the instruments, middle concert C okay. on the piano. The airspeed was the same so if you want to go into the range of the trumpet for example, the range of the French horn in my case, I've got to think of speeding that air up a lot. Mm -hmm. so just think of the size of the mouthpiece of the French horn and the size of the tuba or think of the trumpets, first octave, that would be the top octave of your euphonium. Okay. So you have to think of that air velocity, that's what you're going to need to make that. Yeah. You have a couple more? Uh, I have Okay. probably four. Four more? Yeah. Let's, let's just give me okay. one or two more. Uh, I have had constantly not been able to play any note higher than high F on the euphonium when I'm practicing in a cold environment. However, uh, when I practice in a warm environment, I am able to pitch notes above high F easily. My band practices are always in an air-conditioned room. So, do you have any exercises or tips to help me pitch higher notes in a cold environment? Oh God, I do not have any tips. I had to. I had to play today in the in the outside, and mm -hmm. I, I swear, God, I never had that 
feeling in my life before. It, I didn't feel like I even have a face. It was mm. terrible. Mm. It, it, I didn't play terrible, but it felt terrible. I, mm. But um, I guess you're a little bit more experienced with that. Uh, I think I think the main problem is one of blood circulation. So in a warm environment, let's take that when it works well. It, if if the body is warm naturally, then the blood is flowing a bit more easily than if the if the if the body is cold. And that's why we feel cold, because you know everything slows right down. So a few things that you can do just to keep that uh, blood flowing into the chops. And one is just a simple thing. It goes like this. Flap the lips. Flap the lips. <laughs> I do it for a good minute and you'll feel that you'll feel the blood running Triplish, into the yeah, muscles and that will really it does two things it can relax the face but it also helps to literally warm up the face now we brass players we talk about warming up but we don't warm up in the sense that an athlete that an athlete warms up we don't get the we don't get the muscles and the musculature working with no effort you know like a, da a ballet dancer we do stretching we do all kinds of things uh, before we do weights, we should be doing some cardio uh, mm -hmm. to get the blood going around the system. So the same thing applies to us. You're using the muscles of your face, warm them up, flap the lips, flap them from one side, <coughs> the other side. <coughs> you'll see that one side is weaker than the other. That's quite natural. And then you 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 should feel rather better when before you play the instrument. Just carry a flask, put some hot water, and yeah. sip that thing. <laughs> you could do that too. Sip it up. Could okay, that too. pick one more, any of those, and we're, we're going to be good for today. Mm. Any of them, just go ahead. Okay, let's do this one. This one's a little bit shorter. My name is Alan, and I'm a 14-year-old euphonium player. Soon I will start to learn the euphonium solo Harlequin by Philip Spark. But before I attempt it, I wanted to know if you have any tips on how to maintain the clarity of notes when in the faster section of the song. I noticed that when I play very fast runs, sometimes it sounds like a blur. I would highly appreciate the help. <laughs> oh, it's a piece that uh, you're familiar with as well. It's blur. The blur occurs when you're not exactly playing the right notes, isn't it? That's that's the main reason. It's the reason your fingers are not exactly that. It is kind of in a way you you are playing kind of the right notes, but they're partially right. They're never the timing. They're never full of range motion. That was just the answer is going to be, uh, and I'm pretty sure that's that's something you're going to be saying. But just practice slow and just keep on adding beats. Start find the speed which you can play the whole thing perfectly at. It might be if your end goal is 150 beats per minute, then start at 70, where you can play perfectly, and go 72, 74, 76, up until you cannot play perfectly. Next day you'll find that you can achieve that plateau by going, instead of 72, 74, you can go 74, 78, 82, and go to 120 instead of 150, and the next day you might be 122, and that's at least how I get all my last step working on is just repetition with perfection, yeah. not just repetition. That's what I hear this thing with practicing slow for me. It's not slow, it's practicing well. So usually slow means that you can play it well. And that's that's a whole key. You don't need to play any slower than you need to. You just need to find a tempo where you can play very comfortably, very well, and just keep on improving that margin where you feel comfortable. And at some point it's going to come out. We have some air as well. Yeah, I think that's all very good. Um, to play Harlequin, I would probably start with an Arban study, a scalic one that has um, two two notes slurred, say two sixteenths slurred, and then two sixteenths uh, toned. Or if you're if Alan is a British person, two semiquavers slurred and two <laughs> semiquavers uh, tongue to that that kind of thing because there's a there's a thing that makes us blood sometimes and that's that coordination between the finger and the tongue yeah, that's the last page yeah. so that needs to be that coordination between the finger and tongue needs to be precise because the valves only work efficiently in two places up or down and nothing in between 
Then the next thing that you should do, Alan, is always bang the valves down hard. Don't stroke the valves. The valves need to be pushed right down to the bottom as quickly and efficiently as possible. Is there a reason why you want to bang valves hard rather than yeah. nothing? Yes, because you see, halfway down, the, the length of the valve is no place yes. to be. You want to be either open or and closed. The so that strong motion ensures that we're fully down. And then, then I would recommend um, Alan Vitsuti, Technical exercises, I believe it's in the book one, there's something called finger flexibility, so that will get you moving the fingers efficiently. That's something that we brass players rarely talk about, but pianists talk about all the time. The touch, the rhythm comes from the finger. So if you have a, a slur, Alan, I know your name now, if you have a slur, the, the speed of that slur is determined by the speed of your finger. Yeah. So if the fingers are sloppy, then that slur will be sloppy. And that's the way the way to get around that is to is to practice, as Algada says, slowly and speed up. But make sure that those finger movements are really precise and uh, and accurate. Otherwise you'll never play clearly. And now the good thing about Harlequin worse is usually the problem comes with the third finger. Yes, exactly. And uh, if you're using the fourth uh, with your left hand, then that one is usually uh, not as agile. And if you have a fourth valve, that's terrible. That one is the fifth finger is normally it's usually a terrible one. Good thing about Harlequin doesn't have a lot of combinations with three and four. It's mainly two. The difficult thing it's it's rigorous. It's nonstop. It's like once you hit that. Um, Allegro, it's three yeah. pages long, <laughs> if non-stop. So and and then another thing that is worth practicing is something that the Vitsuti calls finger flexibilities. I think I mentioned it earlier, but it starts on a, we're talking the treble clef, and then you can you can translate it into any clef you like. So it starts on a low G, this works for all instruments, goes to an A, then F sharp. So you've got G, A, F sharp, A, G, A, F sharp, A, G, A, F sharp, A, G, A, F sharp, A. And you can see that's going to exercise that third finger. And if that's nice and rhythmic, if you haven't got time for that, just go to A on the third valve, B natural, G sharp, B. And then you're just using those two back fingers there. That is, that's tremendous. That'll help get yeah. that flexibility in, there, no. in that third valve finger. Now, if you feel pain here, or it starts to get a little bit uncomfortable, just shake it out. And do, be a man. And do, <laughs> yeah, some, be no, do something else and come back the next day. Measure how long you're doing it, a minute, two minutes, and then eventually that will start to clear up nicely. Yeah. Do you do any swung rooms? Like, yeah, I do all of that too. That's like all, all of the slurs, any slurred rhythm is determined by your finger and the discipline there. Okay, so that's going to be it for now. So I hope I pronounce his name correctly. Alan? It's it doesn't matter. <laughs> it does not really matter. It's A-L-A-I-N. Alan? Alan. Alan. Yeah. 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 It has I yeah, person. It's probably a Welsh name. It's probably from yeah. Wales. Might be a Welsh name. Anyways. Great.